All right, welcome everyone. I'm Enrique Bravo Escobar. I'm a program officer here at the National Endowment for Democracy. On um, behalf of the NED's International Forum for Democratic Studies, I am pleased to welcome everyone to today's presentation, The Difficult Road to Transparency in Latin America, featuring Reagan Fossil Democracy Fellow Maria Baron, here on my right. We're delighted to have with us as a discussant, Nicolas Dassen, on my left, Senior Modern Modernization of the State Specialist at the Inter-American Development Bank. Funded by the US Congress, the Reagan Fassell Democracy Fellows Program hosts some of the world's most dedicated democracy activists, scholars, and journalists to conduct independent research and pursue projects here at NED. Since its founding in 2001, the program has hosted more than 270 fellows from over 90 countries. Within this remarkable group, our speaker today stands out for her unwavering commitment to democracy in Latin America in general, and in Argentina in particular. The establishment of the Open Government Partnership in 2011 ushered in a period of optimism amongst transparency campaigners. Launched with only eight participating governments, the partnership has since developed into an alliance with almost 80 countries. The OGP's main mission is to promote transparency, empower citizens, fight corruption, and harness new technologies to strengthen governance. One of OGP's most distinctive features is the collaboration between civil society actors and their governments. And this is critical to develop action plans and establish commitments to advance the open government agenda. As a relatively new initiative, the OGP is still in the process of identifying effective ways of empowering citizens and making governments more accessible. OGP commitments have not consistently translated into heightened transparency, nor have they always led to tangible improvements in the daily lives of citizens, but often they have. In her presentation today, Maria Baron, an Argentine civil society leader, will present key findings from her research on the factors that allow for successful partnerships between governments and civil societies in Latin America. Drawing lessons from successful cases, Maria will offer observations on strategies for forging ahead on the difficult road to transparency in Latin America. Comments by Nicolás will follow. Maria, Maria Barón is the Global Executive Director of Directorio Legislativo, an organization that promotes transparency in government, democratic consolidation, and enhanced access to information throughout Latin America. She's also founding chair of the Latin American Network for Legislative Transparency, a group comp comprising 24 civil society organizations across 12 countries in the region. For her pioneering efforts in advocating for accountability and ethics in government, she received NDI's Democracy Award for Civic Innovation in 2013. She is a member of the Steering Committee of the Open Government Partnership and a board member of the Argentine Network for International Cooperation, RASI. Nicolás Dassen serves as a senior modernization of the state specialist at the Inter-American Development Bank. He previously worked as a private consultant in prevention and control of corruption issues, and as a legal advisor to the Argentine National Congress and the National Judicial Council. From 2000 to 2003, he served as principal analyst at the Bureau of Transparency Policies of the Anti-Corruption Office of Argentina. In that capacity, he was appointed lead country expert before the follow-up mechanism of the implementation of the Inter-American Convention Against Corruption. He also represented Argentina before the Working Group Against Bribery of foreign, poli foreign Public Officials within the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. We will now turn the floor over to Maria, who will speak for approximately 25 minutes, followed by Nicolás for about 10 minutes. Uh, for those of you on Twitter, you can follow this presentation and contribute to this conversation by using the hashtag NetEvents, or by following the forum at Think Democracy and the endowment at, at NetDemocracy. I find it always easier to just print it out 
than to spell it out. So here you have it if you want to follow it. And if you have not already done so, please take a moment to silence your cell phones. And finally, let me take this opportunity to thank the many staff members involved with this event, and most especially research associate <coughs> Kavud Mensa, who has offered vital assistance to the fellowship project and today's presentation. Thank you. Maria? Thank you very much, Enrique, and thank you, Nicolas, also for being here and to be able to comment after uh, my presentation. And to be out of protocol again, another uh, sort of thank you to Kabood, who's the expert at NED, I think, in Excel, which is many of the slides that I'm going to show are uh, graphs uh, ideated by her. So thanks a lot to you for being here um, and this presentation about the difficult road to transparency in Latin America. I'm going to uh, sort of also express my gratefulness to be uh, here at NED and to have spent uh, four months doing this study, which you know us practitioners like NED uh, likes to call us or uh, advocates or activists like we used to call ourselves. Um, are, is, is a time that is really interesting that we never have as practitioners. We always are very alert and really our work is very active, but it's very reactive to what happens in our countries. And so I think it's a good time to sort of take a step back and look at, at what we have been doing, in my case, for many, many years many years than the ones that I want to remember. And uh, so it's interesting to sort of look at what you've done and in a way challenge what you've done and sort of the reactions and the things that you have been advocating for and see if there is any uh, uh, sort of argument and data that can uh, sort of support more what we do. And many times what our work is based on I don't know, something, a law that has been passed and that, that is unconstitutional and we can't even think what to do but just, you know, make a statement or voice ourselves in the Twitter or the social networks. And, or, so you have to be, I would have to say a really strong value is to be alert rather than to think of what you have to do. And so I think this time is really, or has been really interesting for me at least. At the beginning it was really weird to be at my office without being running all the time from here to there. So, <clears throat> but after a while, thanks to Kabood again, eh, this has been a really nice time. And a time that, we're, that I used to go into uh, the data or produce and go into the data that was available to see if um, the transparency initiatives in the hemisphere have been uh, driven by the right uh, things. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to start off talking about the Open Government Partnership. I'm sure many of you know, and many of you, I'm sure you don't. And it's a partnership, like Enrique was saying earlier, that was uh, mostly initiated by Obama. And uh, this is my first slide. And so um, Obama and seven other presidents at the time, in 2011, got together some of the other presidents were Dilma Rousseff, and Felipe Calderón in Latin America and other presidents from other parts of the world. And they got together to see if they could do something about the transparency need in the world. And so they came up with, I think, really strong uh, concepts or really strong ideas of concepts that really helped civil society organizations to work, I think, in a more focused way in the whole world. So 
So the first thing I think is really transformative, I have to say, is the concept of transparency and openness, which we all know in civil society and we all share, but most of the times in our sort of exchange with the governments wasn't shared. You know, so we talked about public information or publishing or uh, specific openness initiatives and they thought one thing about transparency and we thought another thing. And so this was uh, sort of a, a very childish, I think, uh, dialogue. We published such data, but we thought that that data wasn't enough. And so I think they put in a common ground the idea uh, of transparency. We started sharing sort of the values. And so if I, today, after six plus years into the partnership, if I talk about open data or if I talk about uh, electronic data, it's not the same. And most of the times we share those concepts with the government. So I think that's sort of a very subtle but very uh, transformative, I think, concept. The other thing I think it's beautiful, because I've worked many times before the existence of the, many years before the existence of the partnership, so I think it's really interesting, the concept of uh, partners. So it's called the, the Open Government Partnership. And so partners are, uh, the civil society organizations and the governments. So they have sort of set this uh, idea of symmetry, that part that uh, civil society organizations are at the same level, or, or people, are at the same level as the governments in the discussion about transparency. And the thing is, uh, I think that derives from that is that so transparency is a sort of transactional uh, concept. So there's no transparency that is offered. Usually when it's offered, it's not what, what is asked for. And so there needs to be a conversation and that conversation, these people uh, sort of came up with the idea of partners. So if you are going to have a conversation about transparency, you have to be partners. So I think that's the, the, the beautiful thing about this initiative. The second thing is that in order to be partners in this uh, sort of road towards more transparency is the idea that if you are partners, you should come up with the proposals of new policies, co-creating them together in spaces that are sort of, there's a guarantee that the partnership is symmetric. And so you have to remember this sort of word, magic word, co-creation. So in, in, in the more, uh, advancing into the presentation, we're going to go back to it. And then uh, they came up also with the idea of sort of a formality in the sense that these are not sort of policies or ideas that are scattered around. If the countries want to advance into openness and transparency, they should put that together in what they call action plans. So. Peru, whatever country, uh, Colombia, whatever, they should, through a process of co-creation, put together uh, in writing the, what they call commitments. So the proposals that they want the country to go forward, and those proposals are, of course, public, and they are uh, all within this national action plans, what we call. So those are sort of, I think, the most interesting concepts. And I can go on forever, but we're going to stop there in terms of concepts. Um, so based on that, 
And six, like I was saying, you know, six plus years into Obama's idea, many countries have gone these, through this sort of um, line of creating plans full of commitments inside. And now, after uh, this time, I think we need to see if that has been interesting, it has, if it has been transformative, it could be, have been transformative for one country but not for the other, and sort of we need some data. So we need data that already exists, and in my case, uh, I think we need data that is not there yet, and that is what the fellowship, this fellowship is about, to get the data that we don't have. And so I've spent very nerdy four months <laughs> asking a lot of information to the different stakeholders in the country. So the universe more or less is 100 people, or a bit less than 100 people. And we've covered, or me, when I say we, it's me and Kabul. So it's uh, 14 countries. And that's all of the countries that are in Latin America that are part of the partnership, except for um, the US, Canada, and two Caribbean countries that are part of the partnership. And the countries that are not part of the partnership in Latin America, of course, are, guess, Bolivia, Nicaragua, and Venezuela. And so those are out, and Cuba, of course, but not the Caribbean. The Caribbean countries haven't, uh, I think, uh, bought the idea yet about uh, um, about the, the partnership. And so, the first sort of big question, and now we're coming we're coming back to the concept of commitments. So the commitments are remember the proposals that the countries do, and they put them in an action plan. Those. Uh, and so my big question is how to get better of those commitments? How, to, how can those commitments be really, really transformative and be really uh, ambitious? And from what I know about the partnership, my first assumption is and was uh, that the devil is in the details. So we're going to go to this first slide. So don't, don't scare, don't get scared. This is really, really simple. So, um, but you know, organizations, we, we want to put really uh, difficult names to very dumb stages. So this is <laughs> really, don't, don't worry. So there's sort of two parts of um, a process that the country has to go through. The first part is the co-creation process. So remember the process is, that the co-creation process is the spaces that the countries have to guarantee, when I say the countries, it's the governments, they have to guarantee spaces of conversation with the organizations that are in that country. And so this process, uh, the countries can choose sort of what stages they go through in this process, but there are guidelines that tell you the ideal process is this. And so not to go through each of the stages, but this is sort of an informal part in the sense that many countries can shape it however they want if they guarantee the idea of co-creation. And by that, I mean that the organizations need to also acknowledge and agree that they are being part of this co-creation process. And so that's sort of the, um, the interesting thing about it. And so the second part is when the governments have to implement the commitments that they have put together with civil society organizations. And so in this process, they get evaluated two times by the OGP itself, 
and they have to evaluate themselves also two times. Usually they hire uh, consultants. So this is like, this is really formal because they have to follow a schedule and they need to say when they're going to um, evaluate themselves and if they don't, they get a letter and it's, it's really, um, they have to comply with the different stages. And there's dates and there's people that are watching and uh, there's like a, a bit of shame if you don't comply with this process. All this takes two years. And so the, the, I think the, the interesting thing to see here is that um, usually when we practitioners go to the countries uh, to the relation, in the relationship with the governments, they always say, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a good time to talk about transparency now because, you know, there's demonstrations in the street or we're debating abortion or I don't know, there's an infrastructure problem and we know that there's no uh, good time to talk about transparency ever. So if there's an election or if there's an impeachment, so we know that we need to introduce or keep on talking about transparency regardless. If there's a you know, fear that the president is going to fall in anything, transparency needs to be, we think, in the debate because it's transversal cross-cutting. And so just to show you a little bit of what happens in these countries throughout the years while they have to implement these transparency ideas that they have put together with the organizations. Anything can happen, and since the beginning of the partnership, 2011, many things have happened in the different countries. So we took sort of, not, not for you to read, but three sort of highlights, elections or impeachments or strong demonstrations or <coughs> resignations or just to see what can happen in every country while you have to go through this process. So this is sort of things that have happened in the different countries during these years, and also this, and this. And so this is just to show like more graphically that, you know, Peruvian's uh, president can resign, but the process has to go on. And, you know, there's an impeachment in Brazil the process has to go on because it's an international uh, commitment, an international partnership of many countries that are going through many things and there's no um, excuse for not doing it. If you can not doing, do uh, comply with your commitments, you can step off the partnership. And that is not a good thing in terms of a reputation, but you can. And so, just to remember the process, because now we're going to have to sharpen our sight with the, with the graphs. Remember the commitments are the proposals that the countries do and that, that are po all put together in what they call action plans. This is um, a new concept for this, for today. And this is really, really relevant for the future, for the next uh, slides. So you can, the, the commitments that the countries put together are evaluated. And they can be evaluated in two ways, very simple. Through a series of variables, the OGP sort of secretariat, which is, there's a, like a evaluation sort of unit called the IRM evaluates all of the commitments of all the countries. And the commitments can be starred or slash transformative or slash ambitious. The really commitments that are really going to change people's lives or not. So starred or non-starred. If the commitments are starred, we think that there's um, a possibility 
that, like I said before, the, the lives of the people that live in those countries can be uh, really changed in a better way. And so, many times the countries commit, you know that phrase, more is less or less is more or something. And <laughs> okay. So many countries, you know, it's free, it's a free world. You, you can commit to anything, to, you know, cutting all the trees in the Amazon or planting all the trees in the Amazon in whatever. So you can commit to whatever you want. But then those commitments are evaluated and the IRM, the, the sort of evaluation unit within OGB tells you if, the, uh, if, if what you have committed is completed. So you have said you're going to do, you're going to create an agent, an anti-corruption agency in Honduras, and the agency exists. And so there's two things, all the, uh, three, the commitments, if the commitments were completed, and how many of those were starred or transformative or ambitious. So this is the first sort of graph. These are the commitments that the, the, the um, time span is 2011, 2016, because now we're in the deadline of when the two years, 17 and 18, are going to be evaluated. So all the data today is going to be up until 2016 in terms of commitments. So these are the number of commitments that these countries have put together in action plans throughout these years. These are the ones that were completed. So it's much less in most, in, <laughs> yeah. And these are the ones that were starred, that were really transformative. So you see, for example, countries where the difference between what you committed and what is really transformative is there's a long ways. And so the first, I think, conclusion is, like I said before, less is more. Less commitments, more transformative, and completed. So I think there's all the countries in Latin America need to sort of go deeper in what they're proposing. And that is, uh, I think uh, sort of the conclusion here. So, so two things going before the next section. Transparency is never a good moment to be talked about, or we never, we may never come up to the ideal moment, and it's fine. We can't talk about it anyways. So we're going to have in this region like turmoils. We're going to have elections and things. But uh, we, as organizations, need to push this idea anyways. And the second is that what the countries are putting together and what they're committing is maybe too much as regards to what is really, really happening, what is really, really showing in numbers that they can change the lives of the people of the country where they are. Okay. This set of data is more complicated in the sense that, so it's how, how, to, how do you build better commitments? How do you get to the starred commitments? And so I went to the countries and asked them what, what are the factors that make the commitments to be more transformative? And sort of, don't, don't get, um, dizzy about all the colors, but <laughs> this is sort of their answers. And just to be really simple about what they have said, so we gave them some answers, some possible factors that we thought that could 
really changed the way uh, the commitments were built, and they added some more. So just very simple. People thought there are four ideas that they put together that I think are really interesting as a result for all of this research. The first is that there needs to be more formal mechanisms uh, of consultation. And this is when the government has an idea and how formal it is for the government to make it public and get idea like massively from the people. And so all of the actors that were asked were governments, civil society organizations, the OGP itself, and donors, different donors, that fund these initiatives in many countries. So that's the first answer. The second one is that in many of the processes of the countries, you don't have that many high-ranking officials that are participating in those sort of dialogues. And so the answer was you need to have the higher, uh, sort of more hierarchical uh, persons and decision makers that, can, that are in those um, spaces so that the bar is higher. The third one is that uh, the, there should be sort of also thematic organizations rather than not only the transparency and institutional organizations. And then, uh, this is really important, and we're going to see it in, in a couple slides too. Um, the thing about uh, these processes being binding or not. So many organizations bring ideas, some, some crazy, but some are really good, and the governments veto those ideas. And so uh, the people on the ground are saying that it's really important that those ideas are sort of treated more as symmetric. And the last one is the, the, the dialogue when in those spaces should be um, better. And now we're going to s zoom in these five larger factors or the factors that got more answers from the people on the ground and we're going to see sort of by actor. So we're through one of the most complicated uh, graphs. So these are the answers of the government stakeholders. So the government stakeholders think that including decision, like more decision makers in the process and making formal uh, consultations are strong things that make the commitments more ambitious. The civil society organizations don't differ that much in many of the factors. So that's a good thing, I think. It's a good thing that people that usually are against each other or that differ each other, in this case, they don't differ that much because you're going to see the donors a bit more different. They have a different perspective, which is really enriching, I think, but it's different from the people that are in the, the process specifically. And these, this is OGP itself. I think it's really interesting that they really completely, in all of the factors except for one, they disagree with the rest of the stakeholders. I think it's interesting because it, uh, they have another perspective. Uh, but they don't, they're not participating in the process themselves. So if you see sort of a conclusion, if you see the uh, factor about the decision makers, are, that's the one that gets more consensus. And I think it's really interesting that everybody acknowledges that if you have higher ranking officials, then the uh, commitments are more ambitious or could be more ambitious. So that's the first the second conclusion. The, now we have this, which I think is really, really interesting too. And this is 
part of the survey was done to, this is a question that we did only to civil society organizations. And this is, remember, the first part of the process in the timeline, the co-creation process. And it, it's, like I said before, it's an ideal process. You don't have to follow it uh, in the same uh, stages that I, uh, or that we uh, put together, because it's a guideline from OGP, and it's suggested, but it's not uh, compulsory. And I think here that the interesting thing is what we said before, and it's that in all of the process, when you get the ideas and you get the people together and you map the organizations that you want to bring them in the process, and you, in some cases you have manual procedures on how the voting is going to be, and the drafting, and who's going to write it. But the thing that I think is really interesting is that everybody agrees that there's a problem in the negotiation of what they've come up to when the gov they have to take the idea to the government to get approved. And many of the times that idea or that plan leaves the room and goes to the government and it comes back with another form or another shape or with less ambition. And many times the public officials that are in the processes come in with a cap themselves in meaning that, uh, you know, you, my uh, boss already told me that you can't do this, or that we can't go that far. So I think it's interesting and something to work for. So in this uh, graph, I think it's interesting, and this one and this next one are going to be uh, sort of the more complicated ones with the previous, and that's, the, that's it. So here you have the commitments, the start commitments, and you have the OGP visits. Um, and so many actors say that the OGP visits help in the process for the ambitious and help in the process to bring more high-ranking public officials. And that is interesting, seeing this graph. So what we asked uh, to some of the members of the, the stakeholders is, uh, and especially the public officials, one question was, do you feel close to the OGP or not? I know it's a bit touchy-feely, but it's interesting to know if they, even of all the, along all the formalities, what they feel that they, where they are in terms of the relationship. So many of the people that felt close meant that they had <coughs> more, and if they had more visits, and that most of the times coincides with the participating of high-ranking officers, and those three variables together bring higher uh, or starred commitments. So I think that is <laughs> interesting how you can add up the questions and see that there's a really small but a trend <laughs> anyways to put these together, the visits, the, the feeling about being close or not, and the presence of the high-ranking officers. So, I think that's one of the, another of the conclusions of this survey. <coughs> Just to end. And here I'm going to in, introduce another variable, which is what can we, what do we have? What, what do we have that is eh, palpable, that is that you can touch in, with your hands? So I'm introducing the variable about the regulation. Many of these uh, action plans include sort of legislative action or executive action, but not necessarily. So I'm introducing another, a variable that not necessarily 
directly reflects to the action uh, plans that each country puts together. It's just to show you, and this is really, really, I think, a strong uh, number. So the countries in Latin America, this, these 14, since 2011 up until today, together created 188 uh, pieces of legislation. Just to give you a parameter, Argentina is a very sort of organized country in terms of legislation. So most of the times in the past 30 years, they have produced around the same amount of laws every year. So it's good as a parameter. So every year, more or less, you have 1.5 laws about health, 1.5 laws about education, and like that. This is almost three per year on transparency, which for our countries in our region, I think it's really, really transformative if we use this, these up until now are tools, but they could transform our sort of societies too. So putting all that data together, it, the previous graph was divided into the decisions from the executive and the laws. So this one's put together. And we, and I've gone through uh, the methodological uh, sort of crashing of all the books that exist about methodology, but I'm going to compare those or put them together with the with the start commitments. So there's no relationship between the start commitments and the number of laws. Um, but I think we were discussing pre uh, previously with, with Enrique and also with Nicolas. I think OGP creates a space where this can happen. Um, of course, the best examples in all of the charts that you've seen today are Uruguay and Chile and Colombia. And you can see that here too. And so I think it's uh, good that all these countries and the people and the organizations of these countries have the tools to transform where they live today. Only just for you, the curious ones in the audience, all these laws are on these specific issues. So you can see a lot more laws on open data and access to public information than on lobbying. Uh, but that's sort of to, a, f a sort of wave that always happens. So there's a wave on access to public information and then in the next years you're going to have a wave on lobbying and a wave on public ethics and that. So just to put the, the two pieces together, I think, um, it's a tool that we have and that we need to use it as organizations. So the last couple of things as conclusions. Uh, so the research, I think it's really a seed sort of research that needs to be uh, sort of uh, worked more thoroughly and more deeply. Uh, broadening the base of the people that answer the, the questions that we did. Today, I, I can't, with less than 100 people, I can't uh, survey, I can't create a policy that is uh, relevant for a recommendation. And uh, in terms of uh, OGP and its process, like we were saying earlier, it's never a good moment for transparency. The other thing is interesting is that OGP never um, forces uh, sort of a, um, a recipe for success, and that is a good thing and it's a bad thing for a region. So it's a good thing because the, it's sort of a recipe that has worked in Macedonia and then you're bringing it to Paraguay, but it's uh, somehow it leaves a lot of space for informalities, which is something that we have to work a lot on. In terms of uh, 
um, of um, relevance of the, the alliance itself. I think it's interesting. I think one indicator, and, and I'm finishing with this. You're getting nervous, I think. Good. Uh, I think at, at the beginning, for example, Ar how Argentina in was entered the how Argentina entered the process. Someone lost in the bureaucracy sent a Gmail, uh, an email with the Gmail sort of address to someone in OGP, and we never knew like after three months that someone in the government was interested in becoming part of a uh, member of OGP, and that was in 2012. Today in Latin America. Uh, the only country that was not part of the membership is, was Ecuador. And about a month or a month and a half back, the new president inaugurated the Congress. And in his speech, he said, today I'm going to send a letter to OGB to become a member. So I think from there, from the informalities of a Gmail, to the importance that these countries give to an initiative like that, uh, I think is at least uh, something that can really work for, for the future for us if we really use these tools and uh, transform. So thank you very much. All right. Okay, thank you, Maria, for such a data rich and evidence rich uh, presentation. We'll move very quickly to Nicolas so that he can offer some initial uh, comments and then we'll, we'll start a conversation so that we can end in time. Thank you, Enrique, and thank you for the National Endowment for Democracy for inviting me and, and my, my also my appreciation to Maria for, for having me here. Um, uh, yeah, I, I agree with a lot of the, I have much more agreements with Maria than I don't have these agreements. I may add some, some, some things that, that uh, she didn't mention or she didn't thought about. Um, at the Inter-American Development Bank, we are supporting countries in, we are an international partner of OGP and we are helping countries to draft their commitments, their act, national action plans, and, uh, and to implement them. Um, so let, let me start with a, with a slogan, let's say. Uh, you know, the, the time for low-hanging fruits is over. So I, I agree with Maria on, on the challenge of how to make more relevant commitments. Everybody, we, we started this in 2011, and yeah, it was a process, and everybody wanted to learn how the process was. Um, so yeah. The, encourage, the encouragement was, okay, pick up low-hanging fruits. Let's start with commitments that are doable, that you have the budget to finance the implementation. And, uh, and you know, in order to start rolling the ball, understanding the process, being, you know, gaining trust on the, on the, on the whole thing. Uh, but that is over, I think. Um, and, uh, and now, we are facing more challenges. Uh, a lot of com national action plans have a, have a lot of commitments. Uh, ma well, Maria showed the figures. L very little of them are, are significant or start. Um, let me give you, you know, three or four examples. Uh, Argentina went through a lot of, it passed in the, in the last two or three years, significant laws, access to information law, a law on, um, on, on whistleblowing uh, uh, protection and um, a law on the uh, legal responsibility of, of, um, of legal persons or corporations. Th th that was a commitment of the OECD Convention Against Foreign Bribery. Argentina signed that in 1997 and, well, almost 20 years after, they, finally we have the law. But those are good things that miss the opportunity of being in the National Action Plan. Uh, of course, you may say, well, the OGP uh, works on the, on the level of the executive branches. 
at the executive level. Now we are talking about, uh, instead of open government, open state. We want the judiciary and the legislative branch to join in. Some countries they do, like Chile, for example, but and still the, the, the um, but still it's, it's an, it's an, at the, the agreement is at the executive level. Uh, so, having said that, you cannot, but, uh, but you, you cannot, you know, compromise that your parliament is going to vote a law. Yes, but at least you can say that the executive branch will endorse that bill and they will send the bill to Congress. And that is something that you can do if you want. Uh, Chile and Chile went through a similar thing, but but uh, but uh, not but unwillingly. Um, they, they have a couple of, of of corrupt cases in the in the prior previous administration, and that they they react positively. They created a, a commission, anti-corruption commission, headed by a, a by a very well-known scholar uh, called Engel, Eduardo Engel, and they all that commission. They issue a lot of, uh, of, um, of recommendations, and the Congress and the executive branch coordinate and approve those things. Uh, a lot of, uh, it was a big agenda on, on poverty. Um, but it was not reflected in the action plan, which is, so that, 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 uh, that gives me the sec the, another comment is regarding flexibility. Uh, national action plan should be flexible. Sometimes when a new government takes office, they ask OGP, let me, let me make an adjustment, let me make an addenda, or, or you know, I want these commitments uh, to, to be added. So that, that may be a, a possibility um, to think about. And, and, and in fact, some countries, they, 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 they did that. Um, Mexico went under a, a whole constitutional reform. They are still under implementation, that reform. Uh, but but, uh, but th there is some divorce, there still there is a divorce between the decision makers, as Maria put it, and the ones, you know, the, the public officials, the, those points of contact that, that make the will work uh, of the OGP process. So there you have something. And, and everybody agree, agreed with that, you know, in, in, the, in that survey you did. Uh, uh, policy makers, you know, uh, policy makers, NGOs, uh, OGP uh, staff. And um, one, one possibility is, um, is to, you know, I always say that all, all governments have uh, action, have their own government plans. They have their their. It's not only a, a a political party that they have their platforms, and then when they take office, they need to uh, implement that platform. Hopefully, it would you know in a, in a, in an ideal world it would work like that. But also they have national action plans or development plans. You know, they have a a, a route, so they don't have to invent or to think about other things that they are not in there. So, so uh, the, the, my, my comment or suggestion to the OGP process is to, to, to invite governments to make, uh, to make um, complemented and, 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 to, and to coordinate it with, the, uh, with their government plans. Um, and that will imply that they will have budget for those commitments. So, because there are things that are prioritized by the government, they are on the budget, because uh, national action plans don't include, they don't include like a, a budget item. Uh, and, and that's a, sometimes it's a problem from some countries, um, especially small countries. They, they, they pick up non, relevant commitments, they choose non-relevant commitments because they don't imply big resources to be invested in the implementation. Uh, so there, there is something that we have to work on, 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 on being sure that the budget will be uh, take care of. 
Uh, and there, you know, if, if they cannot fund it with national budget, of course, international organizations like the IDB, is, uh, they are there, or international donors uh, are there. Um, for example, Colombia, which is, you know, they, 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 ha they had a commitment which implied the creation of a platform, an online platform. It's a georeferenced map to track the, all the public works that are being funded by royalties from the oil and mining sector. And, and this, ha to, this has two goals. One goal is to, 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 to be accountable before civil society organizations and, and, and the society in general. But the other goal is for the government to know where the money is going and how it's being invested, the, man, the, 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 national, the, the money that is being sent to the municipalities and the regions in Colombia. So it's, it's, uh, it's also a tool for the central government. Uh, and that it costed $30 million. Uh, the IDB contributed with $8 million. But so relevant, so the, the message is relevant commitments are expensive. But, but so that's something that we have to, to take a look. Um, what else? Um, there, is, there is something also, uh, in my comments, mm, we, we still don't have impact. We, we're, there, there is a, you know, I may agree with Maria, and I agree, they say, okay, OGP created like a, an environment where the fact that NGOs and, and governments are on the same level at the, you know, at the steering committee, that, that is good. And, and now, um, you know, governments are, are ma the consultation process to the NGOs is mandatory. It's not binding, but it's mandatory to consult the, the, NG, uh, the civil society, uh, which is good. And then, of course, they, they come with a, with a big laundry list, and uh, so sometimes it's very difficult to, to prioritize. Um, but, it, but it's true that it's like a blend of a lot of people of different sectors and origins. I remember in the 1990s when we had, before that, in the 1980s we had human rights, uh, civil, uh, non-governmental organizations, you know, watching all the, all the, all the process of, of the democratization process in, in Latin America in the 80s. In the 90s, when democracy was recovered, uh, money started to be gone and, and disappear, and that was a problem. And they started the link between, and, and NGOs from transparency start coming up. So there's, there came the first blend between human rights organizations and, and transparency organizations. The third thing, the third uh, sector came with technology. Now you have NGOs working on technology, and, and technology is helping up to, to modernize all the consultative process and the co-creation of, of, of commitments. And, and, and also not, not, this, don't know, not only the design, but also the implementation. So it helps to, to bring advocacy and, 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 and uh, and more follow-up of, of, uh, of the whole process. Uh, so that, that's something that, that is a good thing and, 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 and came to, to stay in our region. So, so um, you know, I, I'm optimistic. In, I'm optimistic on, on, on where we are going, but, but still we have to, to, to the, the, we need the fine tune of, of, uh, of the, um, all, 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 all these big, uh, snowball of the commitments uh, to you know to to be accelerated and, and to be more relevant and, and smaller. Um, so well, I, I let it there and I leave it there. And okay. Thank you, Nicolas. You're welcome. So we we have a we we have a still a lot of time for questions and, and answers, but I will take the privilege of being the moderator to ask the first one. Uh, and here at NED, we, we are fundamentally concerned about democracy, of course. And so 
I, I'd like to know, uh, Maria Nicolás, um, more about this relationship between transparency and democracy. I mean, we often hear that transparency and accountability go hand in hand, and as such, they are considered a key tool in anti-corruption efforts. Uh, however, I do have the impression that often these commitments are very focused on the transparency side of things and much less so on the accountability part of things. We can see countries like Mexico that have made important progress in terms of transparency, but, but the level of impunity is incredibly high. So when we have this situation, we have a lot of information out there and societies that are more aware of what's going on, but also more frustrated because nothing is really happening as a consequence of that information being out there. So I think this frustration, you know, in the field we often see that this, is, this can create a challenge for people's support to democracy when they see the system not working well. So my question here is, so what's missing? What's missing here to make transparency and accountability work and move forward hand in hand with the same in intensity? I'll start with that. Maria, yes. Yeah, Thank you. So I have um, many um, uncoordinated answers for that. So the first thing I, I think uh, is, is the, more, the most obvious. And I think it's, uh, and I'm going to be the devil's advocate in this answer. So we've, as organizations and the international community, we've advocated for many, many years on sort of the wish list of transparency. So if you had these 10 or 15 laws or 10 or 15 initiatives and this perfect you know, director of such an agency was, would be, it was heaven, you know, it would be changing the world and access to public information laws and, uh, and so we have after the wish list was sort of um, agreed, we've had many of the sort of leaders in transparency in the hemisphere that have done it all. You have Chile, you have Mexico, you have in terms of uh, putting together those ideas into action or into agencies or into laws and uh, Brazil, you know what happened. It is so we all know what happened. It's in a really bad shape in terms of anti-corruption and in terms of accountability. So, and Chile too. I mean, we had. Now we don't see it anymore. But in two years back, and Nicolas was mentioning it too, as a consequence of really, really uh, depressing anti-corruption or corruption scandals, they put together the Engels Commission. It's not because they, don't, they didn't have the laws. They had many laws. And Colombia is another example. And so in, the, in that sense, I'll give you more questions than answers. Uh, I think uh, it, it sh as, organization or, uh, as organizations or as a sector, we should do like a more endogamic debate on if we are advocating for something, is there evidence that shows us that we're in the right direction or not? So that's one thing. I, now I'm, I'm not a devil's advocate anymore. So, <laughs> so the other thing is, um, there's I think an interesting trend, a slight trend now uh, that I see at least uh, informally in terms of sort of how to play with the joystick of what we call sort of soft, soft transparency or and uh, uh, hard transparency. So, so hard transparency is, you know, be here in a panel and talk about transparency and my mother would never understand what we're talking about. And still today. And sort of the soft transparency thing is, so uh, the, the transparency as a cross-cutting issue in health, in infrastructure, in um, 
environment in whatever issue that we are um, working in. And I think in that case, in, in, in that sort of second pot, I think we can get a lot of changes uh, in a way. And I think in going back to, to what we were saying earlier, I think OGP is really pushing for that. The thematic uh, sort of debates rather than the more arid transparency oriented because of transparency. And also you risk, like in the examples that I gave you, I think we risk being it the transparency as an objective and it's never an objective it's always a tool and if it's not a tool it doesn't work let me, let me open up uh for the audience to see if anybody has a, a question and if you do please if you can identify yourself yes thank you hi david nelson with uh, american leadership institute um, thank you for your presentation and for the work you're doing. It's fantastic work. Just two sort of technical questions. One is, and this is probably from Maria, is you mentioned the importance of the starred recommendations. Who determines if what recommendation deserves a star? What's, what's the process for, for formalizing that? And then for Nicolas, you talked about the um, engagement with uh, NGOs as, as, as an important step forward in, in the effort. Have you looked at engagement with, with the uh, business private sector, and particularly Within the IDB itself, you have now the America's Business Dialogue, which, in which the private sector made a number of recommendations and, and commitments on transparency at the Summit of the Americas in Lima. Would I answer? Mm -hmm. So um, the OGP, the partnership, they have a, sort of a unit called the Independent Reporting Mechanism. So it's full of uh, sort of academics that study the commitments. And they use a certain uh, group of variables to determine if a uh, commitment is starred or it isn't. And uh, so that is uh, sort of the, that methodology or that uh, formula was agreed by all of the countries that are evaluated. So in a way, there's no sort of discussion we could have discussions on anything, but there's no sort of debate on is it really start or not start? At, at one point, <laughs> this is something that I was expecting that was going to happen. <laughs> so uh, at one point, uh, I think in 2014 more or less, they changed the methodology uh, within OGP. So you have a set of commitments that were evaluated in, in a specific formula and then another set with another formula, which is um, better. But that's, that, that's about it. And so, it, you know, the, the discussion is, it's not start, or yes, it's start, rather than can we see the formula or not. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, private sector organizations have to be more engaged in the OGP process. And, uh, in some countries they are, but in most countries they are not uh, uh, very involved. Um, the IDB, and it's true that we are, um, you know, sponsoring and encouraging the private sector to 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 be part of of uh, of this um, yeah of this movement. Um, it's true that we help them to. Uh, to issue the declaration of the Summit of Americas in Lima recently with a lot of, rec of recommendations. And uh, the, yeah, the private sector, you know, uh, all corruption and the lack of transparency affect the climate business. And also, you know, the private sector always is, you know, is trying to, to, to look for investments and, 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 and uh, there is something that, uh, that is very important is is to to uh, all the um, that is all the uh, this is digitalization of, of 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 public services public transactions to make easier to uh, to make business and also to make uh, easier to any other citizen to to make transactions with the government all that you know uh, interoperability of the systems decentralization dig digitalization uh, so. Um, so it's important to OGP to to include more commitments, 
not only on transparency or, or on accountability, but also commitments on with a citizen-centric approach to make better public services, you know, to make more with less and better. So that, that's the challenge. Uh, with small budgets, you need to be more efficient. And, uh, and if there is a, an opportunity for the private sector to chip in and, 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 and try to, to, to contribute with ideas and, and, and also is part of, the, of a bigger process of consensus. You know, the private sector is very important to have it, uh, uh, you know, to reach out a consensus with any government to, 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 to go forward in, on, on, on one direction. Um, so, um, yeah, th those, are, those are my, my initial thoughts about that, yeah. Thanks. We have a question in the back. Um, Ursula Indacochea from the Your Process of Law Foundation, and my, my question goes to Maria. Um, I've noticed that the, the OGP movement has de developed a, a very specific language in terms of uh, commitments and uh, implementation, and it's uh, at, at certain, uh, in, in, in a sense, it is like the same problems and the same issues that the human rights movement was addressing through the uh, right to access to information, and what, what uh, OGP, in the OGP language is a commitment, in the human rights language is a obligation or a right. So my question is, do you think that these um, different points of view are complementary, or, or in a way, from the perspective of civil society, the OGP language uh, strengthens their, their positions towards the states or towards the um, public officials? So I have to say, I I don't know. I think it creates the, but, but it's a perception. So I've, I mean, I have no data to, to show you that this is the, the right thing uh, or the most uh, data-driven uh, perception. I think uh, we have advocated for so long for a relationship formal relationship with the governments in each of our countries. Uh, so I've, I can't uh, tell you with more anger how many times I was stood up by my own government in meetings for so many years. So, so I was left hanging in the reception of 2,000 members of parliaments thousands of times. To have this, uh, and usually, uh, I think in, in the countries, there's like a, a tense relationship between the organizations and the government. Tense in the sense that these crazy people are you know, asking us for crazy things. And for the first time, it's not us only that are crazy. It's all of the Latin American organizations that are crazy, and there's that partnership that sort of abides by what you've been asking for so long. And I think that, you know, going to, uh, this is my perception, you know, and I think that that language, to have a common language as uh, philosophical as it may sound with the government for the first time, and so we all talk about commitments and we talk about the NAPs instead of national action, and so we talk about the summit. So, what are you going to the summit? And it's the summit of, on OGP and the panel. And I think uh, it creates sort of a community that we didn't have before with the governments, and in many I would have never thought that with our previous government in Argentina, we'd make friends, and we did. Uh, and so we were in this together in the sense that well, it's, maybe it wasn't their way to make Argentina different. Maybe we thought that was the only way, and they had to because they were in this partnership, and you know they might as well have done it anyways. Like philosophically, maybe they didn't think that was the right direction. But I think to have that sort of community, that sense of community, uh, I think it's important to, I think it's important. It's, it's, I think it's good. Two, you know, having said that, 
I think it's a bit, uh, it, ex it, ex sorry, <laughs> it excludes. So if you're not part of that community, well, you won't understand us. So it, it doesn't uh, sort of coagulate more people uh, into this sort of journey. And uh, so if you come to an organization in any of the countries and you're part of the OGB process, then you need to read, <laughs> I don't know, or you need to, to use those words in order to, to be part of, the, of that community. And that, I think it's a bit of uh, a snobby thing. Uh, it's because we are, we've conquered that, you know, and, and we are in the movement in changing the world which is, I don't know, true. <laughs> yeah. But so just to follow, so is it, is it helping that the current and the movement of human rights as well, or do you think it's just really staying within the transparency? No, world? I think it's staying within the transparency thing. Yeah, I thought you were asking that. No, I, I don't see that. I don't know, it can happen, but for example, I have a lot of relationship with human rights organizations that they really, really get bored in the OGP thing. They, I mean, to tell you the truth, they are like, you know, I, I come here because I know you and your friends, but it's not for me. It's a, you, need, you need to feel that this is a, a sort of a tool that you can use. But I don't see in the human rights movement, I don't see that they think that this is a tool that they can use as much as we do. Yeah. I don't know if you agree. <laughs> <laughs> Give me 30 sorry, seconds. Yes, no, um, 30 seconds. Uh, you know, if the, if the NGO on human rights is tracking all the, for example, the Millennium Development Goals on health, on, you know, access to water or uh, uh, education, you know, it depends of what kind of, you know, gender. You know, there are a lot of but information, yeah, yeah there is, yes, yes. All, all, all the civil, uh, all the economic and social and cultural rights, yeah, yeah there is an agenda there in OGP, because it helps to, to, to bring out information to help, be, to make better public policies on human rights, because there is a necessary link there. Uh, and, uh, and, yeah, you have to, yes, to, 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 to learn how to, to benefit from, from that. I believe. Yeah, I agree. It's right, so a more hopeful tone. But thank you, Maria, for a great presentation. I'm, I'm curious as to uh, why <coughs> this initiative seems to have worked as well as it has. In other words, that the governments are part of it, that they take it seriously, that a lot of people participate. Uh, because what, you know, what I have in mind is uh, there was another initiative uh, which was, this one came from, uh, as far as I understand, this initiative came out of the State Department. Um, and I even uh, know some of the people who I think were the ones who conceived of it. Uh, and there was an earlier initiative, the Community of Democracies, that was, which was done in 19, you know, two decades before, 1999, 2000, where it was to create a global community of democratic countries. And it was troubled from the very, very beginning um, it, it was a U.S. idea. It came out of the State Department. Um, and, you know, it was the U.S. and the Polish governments that took the lead. But nobody really got interested in it. Um, and it was not clear what it could do, what it would, uh, you know, what the, the purpose was. It still exists. Um, but, you know, it, nobody probably here even knows about it. I don't know. But, this one, you know, really seems to have a lot of participation at different levels. I think NDI is also managing a parliamentary group. And so this is a significant thing, and it seems to have actually, the governments actually uh, take it seriously. They want to be part of it. And I'm, I'm just curious, uh, you don't have to comment on the other initiative that didn't work, but why did this work? <laughs> <laughs> How weird, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so... I think the difference, uh, so it was initiated at the, but I think it was really a, an Obama's idea, like himself. And also, I think it was a good thing that they, in the eight uh, initial countries, 
So you had the U.S. and the U.K., but you had Brazil, and you had Chile, and you had Mexico, so three big Latin American representatives, and you also had Indonesia and the Philippines. So that would that I think made it really broad, that like the start of this uh, sort of uh, partnership at the beginning. I don't think that they would have thought that they that it would take off as it did. And. You know, to tell you the truth, not to be, I'm being too negative, I think, but uh, <laughs> I think um, many countries uh, of the almost 80 really use this as a wish-wash uh, thing, and they're really not doing that much. And uh, so you have the government of Azerbaijan, who's a member, and uh, and it's really, and they're in the sort of... Uh, Re-evaluating if they're going to to kick them off or not. So there's countries that, or Hungary that was up until December or th of last year. So I think it's a, there's a, that challenge is still there. It's it's not that it's a successful thing yet. It's more successful than other initiatives, and there's been a lot of transformative things that have happened, but that thing about democracy and the relationship between, the, and going to your question, the relationship between democracy and democratic values and transparency needs to be worked a lot more. Because, uh, for example, just to give you an example, um, so there were, there were, so you need to, in order to enter this partnership, there's, uh, you need to comply with four things. You need part of your budget to be public uh, and published in a specific uh, range of time. Uh, you need to have a public uh, uh, an access to public information and a couple of um, other things. And that made Azerbaijan to be able to be in the partnership. So last year we decided, you know, the 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 ambition to entry should be higher. So we had a year discussion on who and what indexes to use if you had a democracy or if you are killing your journalists as Mexico, if you should be in the partnership or if you are going to be in the partnership if... So it was a big discussion. I think not yet uh, really resolved. So the bar is higher, but still, I don't think you, we will have more that many more of the countries that we have. We have 78 or nine. We can have 85. If the rest come in, there are many countries that have human rights violations that have an access to public information law. And so I think, to your point, it's, it's not yet, uh, we're not on the other side of the coast yet. There's something that needs to happen still that, um, that relates democratic values to this initiative. There are some countries that still uh, are not at that level. Nico, do you want to something to that? Uh, yes, thank you. It's, it's a great question. It's a lot of for, food for thought. Maybe the, the, in, in year 2000, it was not ripe enough. The, 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 the you know, the only democratic, uh, all democracies in, in, you know, the public officials 20 years ago, they were not the same of these public officials, where they were, uh, they were, they studied in democracy, where they, you know, that now they are starting to understand what is a, a, a FOIA, a Freedom of Information Public Law. Um, um, so that, that is the, the public official is different. Civil society is very different. They, they in year in year two thousand we are still trying to to uh, to bring a consciousness and, and 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 doing a lot of advocacy work on on NGOs to understand what a budget is and what the rights are and their rights all, all the concept of rule of law and accountability where we were still claiming information and, 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 and accountability from our public officials. So the time was not ripe by that. And also then you have, for in, in, in the last 20 years, a lot of middle class, uh, in middle income class families came up 
uh, and now the discussion now is w the claim is okay big better public services the, the people is more demanding and and social and with the social media is much more communicated and they receive more information and and, and their demands increase so uh, so I think my explanation is around there around those things I'll take one final question in the back uh, before we go, and we'll, we'll have quick answers to it so that we can wrap up in time and let you guys go out. Back there, yeah. Thank you for your, your wonderful discussion and um, for sharing the findings of your... Can you just identify yourself for everybody? I will, I will, I will. <laughs> Keep calm. I'm, 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 I'm first uh, thanking, my, my thanking uh, Maria uh, and Nicolas for the for the discussion, and uh, the person thank, thanking is Juan Pablo Guerrero from the Global Initiative for Fiscal Transparency. Um, uh, so, uh, as uh, as part of the discussion made it clear, there are many uh, improvements in the region on transparency that hasn't been at all part of OGP, and that is okay. Uh, so, OGP won't give us a comprehensive idea of transparency in the region for that reason. That said, many interesting, important, significant, and, and start things are happening in OGP, and the question is uh, how, how would you categorize its most important contribution to the region, and how do you see OGP evolving in the near future? Because for some of us who have been there from the beginning, OGP has also been going through rocky uh, roads, and uh, for so, some of our friends are completely disillusioned. So, to both of you, the question is: What the best contribution, the most important contribution, and what about the future? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, it's a good question. I think <coughs> a good last question. Uh, I think um, I think the greatest uh, contribution uh, to Latin America, at least, because in Asia it's not it hasn't uh, you know landed as it has in our, in our region. Like like I said before, if the only countries in continental Latin America that aren't part of the partnership are Bolivia, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. And so I think uh, the greatest uh, uh, contribution was to create a formality in the, uh, with the process and uh, um, a series of evaluations, but it's formal. If you want to be part of this uh, alliance or this partnership, you must abide by that. And that is really different from what we had before. Totally different, two different worlds. Then, you know, you can be in this uh, partnership and really wish-wash and don't do anything, but there are many countries that are. So I always, my pragmatism comes back always, and it's that or nothing. So nothing up until 2011, and as from now, we have this. I, I'd rather stay with this. So that's the, uh, some kind of formality in Latin America I think that's the greatest thing, to have the countries go through a process and get evaluated. And uh, so I remember once uh, the, in 2013 or 12, 13, well, I don't remember, 12 or 13 in December, uh, the UK government hosted a summit. And this was for Argentina, the initial steps in OGP. And Argentina sent three public officials for the first time to see and talk and you know listen to the debate about transparency in the UK nothing less and so you know it was 5000 people public officials from many countries like Indonesia Paraguay whatever and the three of them at the end of the four or five days of the event they came to me and they said you know this is all, all this has, that has happened here is all colonialism. 
this is OGP thing is colonialism. You know, we're here in the UK, it's an Obama initiative. So that was really the, at least in a, in, in a set of countries, in Latin America you know well, that's the idea that it's not there anymore. It's not about Obama or it's not, it's about what you want to do within your country. And I think that is really uh, something that has, uh, that the countries have really bought. If they do transformative things as from their, it's, it's their own will, I have to say. But I think that is the highlight. And then uh, looking forward, I see many things, but I don't know if <laughs> they're going to materialize. One of the things that we've talked a lot, uh, two things that we've talked a lot, uh, a lot, and I think they're going to happen as from 2019, for example, is the idea of and voice. So Mexico had a really bad situation with the surveillance of uh, journalists and organizations that are part of the OGP process. And uh, so OGP sent a group of people to sort of study the situation and see how they could sort of overcome this. I think I see that a lot within OGP, but in a more uh, prevention manner. So we know that, for example, today, the Peruvian process is not working, not because of the president resigning, but before that. So it's sort of the envoy system of what we see that will be not good in six, one year, six months, one year. One thing, envoy sort of a methodology. Another thing that has been uh, sort of in the minds of many people is the school, I don't know how they call it, school of champions or something. So to identify the different people that are good champions in the different countries, get them together to uh, talk about the things that they've done, uh, you know, get cases together and let them uh, sort of pass on what they've done and their uh, anger and their uh, sort of to incentivize others in their own countries and in others. Leave it at that, but I can go on <laughs> over coffee. Thank you. Um, for me, yeah, the most important contribution of, of, of OCP is the, the possibility of giving uh, a microphone and the possibility of giving uh, a, um, a seat on the table of uh, with government to NGOs. Uh, NGOs are sitting and being consulted on an action plan, and that is the best thing. It uh, the um, all other follow-up mechanisms the, of international conventions they don't have that. The Inter-American Convention Against Corruption has a lower level of civil society participation. The monitoring system. The, uh, the OECD foreign bribery as well. The uh, FATF, the, the, um, the Financial Action Task Force on Money Laundering, it doesn't have a, at the same level of civil society participation. So a lot of international mechanisms they don't have. Uh, the EITI, the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, yes, it has a, 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 you know, a three-leg government, civil society, and private sector. There they have it. And I know GIFT, but that it was created after, uh, afterwards, uh, it, it does have also a, a leg there. But, um, but, but I think the contribution is the idea of having the same level of governance and, and uh, uh, for civil society organizations. And that provides a lot of, uh, of, um, of public awareness, it, you know, it spreads out, the, the concept of open government is very, very spread out, and, uh, and people is being conscious that it's like a, it's, a poli it's not a technical, it, it is a technical concept, but it's a political concept, the idea of open government, the idea of civil society, not only participation, civil society participation and collaboration, the idea of being part of the solution, of co-implementing and co-creating the solutions. Mm -hmm. So that's another concept. It goes beyond representative democracy. It's something 
more ambitious and more dialogical, so to speak. Uh, and the future. Uh, yeah, in the short term, nothing's going to change. I understand that you are uh, disillusioned, uh, and maybe I, ag I agree with that. That is the OGP had at the beginning the uh, goal of being a high politically, uh, you know, a, uh, has a lot of visibility, a high political visibility, a lot of political will to advance in the reforms. We are still not there. We, we already spoke a lot about that. Um, uh, so uh, things have to be changed or increased, you know, something we have to find as a solution. But OGP will stay, will stay and will keep on advancing. It's, not, it's an initiative that, that came to, to be with us around uh, for a lot of years uh, in, in, in the future. But, but, but we need a, a something, a, a qualitative better as, uh, to be revamped qualitatively. Thank you. Well, on that optimist note uh, that I appreciate, I want to thank Maria and Nicolas for their excellent presentations, and of course, the International Forum for Democratic Studies at the National Endowment for Democracy for having this panel. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming and joining this conversation. Um, have a good afternoon.